folks are still coming in, but we're going to go ahead and get started because we have a lot of ground to cover in a very short uh, period of time considering uh, how much interest and how much work is being done on the housing front. So I'm uh, Rebecca Kelly. I'm, I work in the governor's office. I'm the liaison to the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, which has the housing department in it. Um, so I'm going to just kick this off and turn it over to the group. Just wanted to let folks know uh, we are trying to cover a lot of housing ground, both through our Department of for uh, Children and Families and our Department for Housing and Community Development. So I'm going to try to, these folks are going to try very hard to uh, stay on schedule. I might jump in and either open it up for questions if it looks like folks have them, or move us along to make sure that we can cover both ends of this scale. Um, we will, we are here to take legislators' questions, so we will be pausing periodically, or if you want to just try to flag, we'll try to find a, a stopping point to answer those questions. Uh, but we do want to keep things moving, so if there are more in-depth questions or things that we can't fit into this, please connect with our office or with this team or others to answer your questions. Uh, for press or anybody, any non-legislators in the room, this really is a legislative briefing. We can also connect with you separately after the fact if you have other questions. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to the Department for Children and Families. Thank you. And uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Dr. Harry Chen. I'm the Interim Commissioner for the Department for Children and Families. And uh, I'm here really tonight to kind of kick it off and to, uh, turn over the briefing to our Senior Policy Advisor, Katerina Lazaz. So I think, you know, you, you'll learn tonight about some of the complexities of housing, uh, and you'll learn about what we at, these, at the Department for Children and Families does in terms of our housing. It's primarily emergency housing uh, in, in our general assistance program and also the transitional housing program. It was one of those, one of the programs that was uh, stood up during the pandemic to really try to address the, the health and safety needs uh, of this uh, very uh, vulnerable population. Um, you'll learn tonight that uh, we really, this is an all government um, uh, enterprise and that we work with our uh, partners in the Agency of Commerce and Economic Development you'll learn that we also depend on, on many partners uh, in the field. These are the partners that actually provide the support to uh, the individuals in the hotels, in the transitional housing programs, and in the shelters, because ultimately, the goal is to both uh, provide uh, a safe and, and healthy place for them to be, but also transition them to permanent housing. Uh, it, none of this could happen without the partnerships of the community um, providers and the partnerships uh, and the hardworking um, uh, individuals at the Department for Children and Families and the Economic Service Divisions, many of which are represented here. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Katerina uh, to provide this background. Right. I have a lot of things in my hands, but I'm going to stand over here. Um, so to start, as Rebecca said, I'm going to go pretty fast. You do have the material in front of you. So I'll be saying uh, some new things and some additional information for context. But again, I'm happy to answer questions either at the end of this or um, later when we can connect. So what we wanted to first start with is what does homelessness mean or homeless mean? So DCF uses the US Department of Housing and Urban Development division, uh, definition of homelessness, literal homelessness. So um, you can see on the screen what a person can um, be experiencing to, to fit this definition. But I think what is most important to our work as um, a department within the Agency of Human Services is that a person can enter homelessness for a variety of reasons. I think when we look at the root causes of homelessness, we look at economic instability, we look at challenges with the healthcare system, and we look at um, uh, uh, untreated health issues and social inequities, such as racial um, inequality and domestic violence. Um, and then I would just like to underscore the, the presentation with saying, the housing crisis is faced by all Vermonters, um, average Vermonters included. So when we think about finding housing for someone who is experiencing homelessness, um, it's often even more insurmountable for them. Um, and then when you couple that with experiencing um, you know, other challenges, social challenges or um, health challenges, you know, that can seem even more difficult. Oops, sorry. So this is, 
how many people or approximation of how many people are experiencing homelessness in Vermont. Um, there's just under 2,500 uh, 2, households experiencing homelessness, and that's over 600 children. Um, so as Dr. Chen mentioned, um, DCF has leveraged many federal funding sources to continue to serve Vermonters experiencing homelessness. And, and I'd like to emphasize that over 2,800 households have exited homelessness into permanent housing since the beginning of the pandemic. So something that a lot of people feel is that it's a stagnant population that's experiencing homelessness right now in our state, but that's untrue the, um, because we know that that 2,800 households have exited to the permanent housing. Um, and then just again, we are leveraging those federal funding resources and many of them are the coronavirus relief funds and, and that are winding down. So to go into a little bit about the programs that are serving people experiencing homelessness, DCF administers the transitional housing program, um, which serves just over 1,300 households um, in motels and hotels across the state. The transitional housing program was created to respond to the immediate increase in Vermonters experiencing homelessness exacerbated by the pandemic. The pandemic, uh, or this program serves households at or below 80% area median income, and most households are, so 90% are at or below 30% area median income. Our historic program in hotels and motels is the General Assistance Emergency Housing Program. This serves just under 500 households right now, um, and you have to meet very specific eligibility requirements that also come with a certain number of days that you receive those services. Um, in the winter months, we do have an adverse weather conditions policy that expands the, that eligibility, which is why we're seeing a, a slight increase right now of the household served. And then the last one I just wanna um, talk about for services that are um, helping households experiencing homelessness is our emergency shelter network. So right now we have 28 emergency shelters, 23 emergency apartments, as well as domestic violence agencies accessing hotels and motels as well. Um, DCF funds these programs, uh, many of these programs for their services and operations um, around the state. And a, a big emphasis, which you'll see, is that there were significant investments to increase staffing capacity and raise wages during the pandemic to support the staff that are serving households experiencing homelessness. Um, the next few slides I'm gonna go through kind of quickly, but they give you um, a better idea of what people are facing in addition to homelessness. So you'll see that people being served in our shelter system, um, are a lot of them are experiencing Chronic homelessness, have a mental health disorder, a substance use disorder, or another disability. And the disabilities are self-reported. Um, you'll see the trend over time. There was a steep increase in the data on the number of people experiencing homelessness in 2021, and that correlates with the, the beginning of the pandemic when the data was collected um, to, to when we expanded eligibility for our programs. So this, this information is collected at one point in the year, in January of every year, so that's why you see the increase then. And then um, we're also seeing an increase in the number of days that people are experiencing homelessness. So in 2019, we had a low of 54 days, an average of 54 days a person is experiencing homelessness, where you'll see in 2022, we have 238 days. Why am I telling you this? because um, DCF uses the framework of what is a solution or end to homelessness is um, keeping it rare, brief, and non-recurring. So when we look at the number of days someone is experiencing homelessness, it's indicative of you know, other pressures that people are experiencing to that exit, such as um, an affordable unit to exit into. Um, but to also emphasize, how do we um, what is the framework that we use to categorize how we move forward for ending homelessness? And that's this three legs of the stool to solving homelessness. So first, you need a unit. If you're going to not be homeless, you need a house to be in. Um, you also need rental assistance to fill the affordability gap or 
Often that's a, a housing choice voucher or some other type of rental assistance to keep you in that unit and paying your rent on time. And lastly is the supportive services. So these are individualized services to serve the household in that unit and to keep them in that unit. Um, so uh, when you see that someone might be having a mental health um, crisis or a substance use disorder, it's having access to those services as well. Um, to talk about what we did over the COVID pandemic response is that we did stand up a lot of efforts to continue to serve individuals. So we expanded our motel voucher program, as, as you could see in the transitional housing program numbers. Um, and that was initially the response to COVID, to keep people safe and healthy in those non-congregate settings, especially at the beginning of the pandemic when we didn't know as much about COVID-19. Um, we had alternative COVID-19 isolation and quarantine housing for people who you know, uh, experienced COVID for a place for them to be to keep the, those other resources safe and healthy for the people who didn't have COVID. And then we've had additional supports for our shelter network. So there were regular calls with the shelter network to have you know, on the ground support for them, um, training, supplies, rapid response, et cetera. You, you have the packet. <laughs> um, oh, sorry, this slide's like this. But this is to show how many number of, pro, of um, projects and programs that we stood up over the course of the pandemic, mostly with um, federal funding to support these programs um, to advance our efforts to serve this population. Oh, and one more. Um, once we determined that the federal funding would, um, would wind down during this fiscal year, we held a number of community engagement meetings across the state. And we had um, 14 meetings with, uh, with housing partners and service providers um, it was attended by almost 100 community organizations um, with over 300 attendees. I guess when you get the electronic copy, you can have the real link to the summary. But that, those meetings helped us determine how we're moving forward with a lot of our efforts, um, you know, keeping in mind that three leg of the stool, but also direct community feedback for, for what we should do next. Um, and then I just wanted to talk about some of the strategies that we're working on right now. So um, when we talk about local collaboration and coordination, we have the homelessness healthcare capacity building projects, which are linking DCF with VDH, um, the Vermont Department of Health, um, to coordinate care for, for these households. We are um, working on our coordinated entry process. So coordinated entry is the process in which anyone experiencing homelessness is connected to and it leads them through the process both to navigate services but also to enter their housing unit um, and we're we're sort of beefing up um, the efforts around that to both get people into that um, data system but also how we as a state support that data system um, emphasizing some of those support services because again when we talk about the three legs of the stool that's an important part of that stool we have um, a new um, coordinated care teams that the Agency of Human Services is supporting um, both the DCF um, staff, but also higher ability and um, a nurse from the Vermont Chronic Care Initiative that is going out to all of the hotels and motels and connecting with the households in those programs um, to both connect them to services, but also help them build that exit plan to um, permanent housing. Um, we have housing stability services that is jointly administered by DHCD and DCF that's um, federally funded and supporting people who are experiencing homelessness or on the edge of homelessness. Um, we have a new landlord relief program that's launching next month, which will be the first um, rental risk mitigation fund. So that's a fund to support landlords um, choosing to serve this population and giving them some extra benefits. Um, and then as the governor addressed in his inaugural address, um, we want to address zoning and permitting barriers to expanding emergency shelters around the state because as our programs wind down because of the availability of federal funding, we want to make sure that there are other options for people to go into. Um, and then I think 
One way to, um, to address homelessness is to never have it occur. So an important part of that is homeless prevention services. So this uh, last month, we have additional funding in our housing opportunity grant program to prevent homelessness. So helping people who are at risk of homelessness um, have access to um, their back rent or their rental or, or arrearages being paid. Um, and then we also ex temporarily expanded the Vermont Rental Subsidy Program, which is administered by DCF, specifically for reach up families. So reach up families have been receiving rental assistance. Um, you max out at 18 months. Some of them are coming to those 18 months, but still don't have a way for paying for their rent. So we're making sure that they stay in their permanent housing um, instead of entering homelessness. We're also launching the Home Family Housing Voucher Program, which launched this month um, and is going to serve about 100 families exiting homelessness. You'll see in the Budget Adjustment Act that we have an additional $3 million to support this program, um, to support an additional 150 households with children. And this is modeled after something that was funded by the CARES Act um, that helped 272 families um, with this temporary voucher. Um, you'll get the electronic copy, but I wanted to make sure that you had some access to some of the work that we've been doing in the past year, um, as well as the VHCB legislative housing presentation that, that occurred last month. And then this is just a helpful framework when you think about how we address homelessness. This was created in the Roadmap to End Homelessness, which was the report that um, came out in 2016. And it gives you sort of these buckets to think through that we need to support around the state. I think I did that as quickly as I could, but there's our contact information. Um, and I guess I'll open it up to question. Is that, yeah, Rebecca, I'll open it up to questions. where people from out of town or out of the state have come in and take advantage of that? I think um, that becomes hard for us to quantify because when someone um, is eligible for the program, they have to say that they're going to stay in Vermont. And that's, um, that's our, our best piece of information. I think anecdotally, we can say, yes, there are people coming from out of state, but we don't have the data because that's not how the eligibility criteria operates um, because of a, a Supreme Court decision. Nicole or Andy, would you add anything to that? Okay. Uh, yes? Uh, in all your figures you showed uh, today, I wondered, are we paying for homeless to stay in our hotels now? Is the state paying for that now or is that <laughs> reverted to federal or just, or well, maybe we're not paying at all. Could you clarify? No, I'm happy to uh, shed more light on that. Right now it's all, or it's mostly federal funding going to that. Um, we're using the emergency rental assistance program funds, which are funding six different programs in the state, um, but it's a big bucket of money. It's $352 million, um, but we have almost spent it all. So the programs will be coming the specific transitional housing program will come to an end um, at the end of March. Um, so right now it's mostly federal funding. There are specific eligibility requirements of that federal funding source. Um, you can only have 18 months worth of funding. Um, so for those who have maxed out those 18 months, we do have some state funding that's supporting that. But I think the vast majority, I would say, you know, 95%, if not more, is all federal funding. Um, we're spending over $7 million a month. So the, that emergency fund you're talking about is a federal fund? Yes. Federal That's correct. Fund, thank you. Yes. Um, earlier in the slides, the uh, people having a uh, homeless uh, the, shoot, the shoot up in 2000 there, you had quickly mentioned something about like the criteria changing as part of that big jump. And was that, a couple slides before that, it said we use 
literal homeless category one, did we use a different category and that's more people qualified or what was the? So this was, um, the point in time count occurs in January. Um, so the pandemic you know, began in March, 2020. So the next time that we did a count was 2021. In March, 2020 is when we expanded the hotel motel program to be more or less open doors as a public health response. So the next January was the first time we could count. So that's why this slide looks like a giant jump in 2021, but it's actually just the um, opening of that eligibility. I see you no other questions. I'm gonna pass it over to Alex. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, I noticed that a lot of the money that goes out goes out to nonprofit agencies. What's your plan or do you have any strategy to use, like for instance, a builder who has an approved project in a town to build houses but doesn't have money to put the road in yet? I mean, I think that actually Alex would be the perfect person to answer that question. Um, yeah, so I, I think that there's a lot of creative solutions right now to build permanent housing. Uh, and there's my segue. <laughs> oh, this is really good. All right. Let's see if I can. I don't know how you did this, Katarina. All right, hi. So I'm Alex Farrell. I'm the Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Housing and Community Development. The commissioner is right here, Josh Hanford. I, I often say that I'm his cover band, and we'll see tonight if he thinks I do okay. This is Sean Gilpin right here, the, the housing director in our department. Uh, you'll see all three of our faces in the legislature from time to time. So what I'm gonna touch on um, here is, it's, I'm not gonna be able to hit all of our programs, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the approaches we're taking, the way we're thinking about trying to fund and develop housing right now, and then what we have seen in particular through the pandemic response that we're gonna to need to do in order to make sure we can continue to make improvements uh, in alleviating the housing crisis, even once this historic funding now goes away. So you can see up here, I've got the department's mission and all that I wanna highlight in this, I'm not gonna read it to you, all I wanna highlight is you can see, it takes a lot more than just funding houses and building homes in order to meet the housing crisis. There's a lot that goes into preparing communities for building. Uh, and you know somebody just touched on infrastructure and we can talk about that a little bit more. Um, but that is one of the big barriers at times to building new housing is just getting the infrastructure in to allow for that. So uh, communities really need to be thoughtful about how they uh, invest and plan for housing into the future. Okay, so, so yeah, so setting the scene, how did we get here? And some of the scene was just set with Katarina's presentation of sort of how drastic this is, what we're facing, but this is decades in the making. And so the, the line chart you're seeing here on the left, this shows building permits over time. And so what you can see is that the last time we were really building at the pace that was meeting our needs was in the 80s. And now the trajectory here, you can see a little peak after 2000, but it continued to drop off. And uh, that's in large part a, refl a reflection of both state and local policies that were us Vermonters very intentionally put into place to curb development. The governor touched on this in his inaugural address where you know, at, at, at a certain time maybe there were legitimate concerns about the, the pace of growth uh, and so people were responding to that, but we can see that's now put us in a situation where it is, it is becoming impossible to meet the needs and so we find ourselves in the situation we're in. And you can see over here, um, this is the rate of change in housing supply. Um, we are uh, losing units, and I'm gonna show you a slide in a second that shows you the uh, age of our housing stock. Building new units is not necessarily going to equate to net new because the age of our housing stock, we do lose housing units. And um, Vermont has one of the oldest housing stocks in the country. So this right here actually can show you how old our housing stock is. So this biggest bar right here, 1939 or earlier. And so this is especially challenging in rural communities where uh, we've got housing units, but because of the age, perhaps they're falling into disrepair, it's harder to keep them up to code. And these are units that we desperately need in, or in order to house folks. So we do have strategies in place right now that we're implementing to, to counteract that. But this is just to say, the, the rate at which we build new needs to take into account that we have an old housing stock and we lose units. 
So talking about preparing uh, communities for, for development, preparing them for housing. So municipal planning grants and the bylaw modernization grants, you can see some numbers up here about the, you know, what we've invested in these communities. The purpose here is uh, just what I was talking about before. We know that either uh, communities don't have zoning or they have outdated zoning. That doesn't necessarily enable or focus development where we know we have uh, the resources. For example, if there's sewer and water uh, and roads in a certain part of a, a downtown or a village, that's where we should be focusing our development in a community. And so in order to make sure communities are ready for that and uh, developers can go in and they understand the process, the process can be predictable, we can go in with bylaw modernization grants and help them improve that zoning. And this has been, uh, we have continued funding for bylaw modernization grants, but um, you know, 53 communities with that amount of money, this is slow progress. We need to keep doing this, and this is incredibly impactful in preparing communities for uh, future growth, but this is very slow progress. So while we are working at this problem of, of land use and improving our zoning, we know that there's a lot more we need to be doing. Uh, the state designation program, so this is a really, really good tool. This aligns incentives, this helps to uh, alleviate some of the barriers to housing, such as uh, Act 250. Um, so this, when you hear downtowns, village centers, growth areas, this is the state designation program. And this is really, really how we help to focus uh, where we know we want to grow, where communities are ready for growth, this is how we can uh, create some incentives and reduce barriers to building there. So I'm going to talk about a success story. So this, the pictures you see here are from Bristol, and this is sort of just a tale of how a community has uh, really planned for growth. They recognize the need to reinvest in their community and they now haven't stopped. So the first picture in the top left, that's Bristol in 1979. And if you look at that downtown, that might not necessarily be a place where you wanna spend time, where you wanna open a business, where you'd wanna rent an apartment. So Bristol, through very thoughtful um, investment and, and uh, sort of re-engagement with their downtown, you can see now this was taken right before the pandemic. And it's such a drastic difference, but the years that I just mentioned right there, I think are what's really important. It took a very, very long time and it took thoughtful focus on uh, revitalizing their downtown. And so that's, that's the, the amount of work that it took to get Bristol back to an energized, beautiful downtown that we know, know it as now. But Bristol hasn't stopped. So what you see up on the top right, this is a groundbreaking for uh, some apartments on Firehouse Road. Is that right? Yeah. And so uh, back in 2015, they came to us, got a planning grant through our Vermont Community Development Program. I'm gonna to touch on that in a second. But uh, did a feasibility study, started planning for where housing could go. A few years later, had a project on that site, got funding through the Vermont Community Development Program, a few other sources for uh, VHCB, Vermont Housing Conservation Board, and now has broken ground on those apartments. And so this is something that takes very thoughtful uh, and, and intentional action over time. I think somebody's calling us. Okay. Oh, that's, all right, good. They didn't want anything. Um, so VCDP, I bet a lot of people in here have either seen VCD, VCDP project or have some uh, have some experience with community development block grants, but so Vermont Community Development Program is housed within the Department of Housing and Community Development. So this is funded through HUD, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, through the Community Development Block Grant Program. And so this is our sort of ongoing annual federal allocation that we get. This is a, a program that we've had since the 70s and consistently funds between seven and eight million dollars um, but just to make the point that this is a program that we really uh, have to work with other funders and we leverage private funding in order to help development happen. So the numbers you see up here, 6.1 million invested. This is during program year 22. And then the private dollars that are leveraged as a result of that. Um, and that you know, also is paired with uh, Vermont Housing Finance Agency's uh, tax credit, low-income housing tax credit, 
it's paired with Vermont Housing Conservation Board. So people utilize this program because it can really, uh, you can use it whether it's for infrastructure for housing, for a community space, or for an actual housing project. It's very versatile, but, uh, but, but funding and the funding stack can be really complicated, and this can be a really crucial tool. Um, so now just touching on an example of a success story that uh, CDBG and the Vermont Community Development Pro Program was uh, involved in. Um, so, you know, I talked before about how VCDP could be used for both planning and then actually investing in a project, and that happened in Bristol. And now um, this is a story about Putnam Block down in Bennington. And while they didn't use VCDP for a planning grant, this was very intentional action by Bennington to focus on Putnam Block, which is right in the heart of their downtown, uh, very visible, and really a reinvestment in the Putnam Block, this four acre section, was a reinvestment in the entire town of Bennington. And so this, uh, this required 17 different funding sources. It, uh, it had money from, from our program, from VHFA, it had money from VHCB, uh, all of our major housing partners, as well as several other, it's in an opportunity zone, so it leveraged private opportunity zone funds. But this is what it takes. It takes very intentional action and, and forethought by the municipality. And years later, it became uh, a tremendous success story, but enabling and, and uh, the municipality planning for this revitalization took a very long time. It took a lot of work, and it took very intentional action um, and in many cases to undo what had been done in years past. So this is a couple examples. This is not every housing program we have that directly funds the development of housing, but this is a couple items. Uh, and two of these are uh, fairly new, one's very new. Uh, so on the top left, one of the incentives that I was alluding to before with our state designation programs, the downtown and village center tax credits, this is a huge source of, um, this tax credit leverages a ton of private funding. And if you go to downtown St. Albans, you can see that's one example of where there's tremendous benefit from tax credits um, at, at, in that uh, designated downtown. Um, now over here, so the Vermont Housing Improvement Program, this is directly funding unit creation but it happens in a very different way than we typically see when it comes to creating affordable units. So firstly, I'll just point to the, the number that you see up here. Um, actually, I believe Sean now is 408, right? Uh, John, no, that's, yeah, that's what we know for now, that's been Okay, all right, so that's right. So anyway, almost exclusively focus on the creation uh, on, on rehousing folks out of homelessness. Um, and this is happening at, see the average cost right here, $31,000 per unit. This is a program focused on bringing back online units that have fallen out of disrepair or creating an accessory dwelling unit. So this 31,000 is more significant than it might, might appear. Um, at a time right now when we're seeing new unit creation anywhere from 300,000, 400,000, 500,000 for a single unit, even in uh, a multi-unit building, to be bringing units back online at $31,000 a piece and focus on, focusing on rehousing folks out of homelessness, uh, housing refugees, that is a tremendous tool that we now have in our tool belt. Uh, a new program that's uh, it, it's still in the pilot phase and uh, it just started accepting applications, the Missing Middle uh, Home Ownership uh, Development Program so this came out of the recognition that there's a, there's a math problem right now in developing single family homes. And what that math problem basically is that we cannot build affordable homes for the moderate income person, somebody making around the median income for an area. Now we, we focus so many of our housing funds on folks that are low income. Uh, you know, a, a sort of a, a loose definition, we could just say 80% uh, of the area median income or below. Uh, oftentimes focus on extremely low income, which is far lower than that. But that is only helping one, one part of the housing spectrum. And if we're gonna solve this crisis, we're gonna make, need to make sure that we don't choke off a certain part of that spectrum. And so this, in, in addition to continuing to fund things like shared equity or, or serving folks at 80% uh, or less of area median income, this is a program that is helping 
not only to fund development, but also subsidize buyers up to, on a sliding scale, just over the median income. So th this is a recognition that uh, for workforce development, for the sake of allowing you know, our population to continue to grow, we need to fund all parts of the income spectrum when it comes to housing and helping to get those folks out of rentals and into home ownership. So I'm just gonna touch on VHIP again real quick because what's great about VHIP is that, um, you know, while it, it's a tremendous tool in all parts of the state, uh, you can see sort of it's, it's achieving this um, uh, more geographic equality because in a place like say the Northeast Kingdom, Southern Vermont, where there might be housing stock sitting there, but it's empty because it's holding out of code. This is a tremendous tool now to bring those units back online get somebody living in those units, now we don't have a downtown with just empty housing sitting there. So you can see the, um, how, how this has spread out across the state and you know just the fact that Chittenden is not the largest in this list I think says a lot about how this tool has been used across the state to fund uh, private property owners and bringing units back online. Oops, did I jump ahead? Okay. So, and you know, I just, I just kind of want to recap, you know, where, where we came through and what our focus is going to be um, going forward. So, you know, I touched on some of the, the proven tools, uh, the tax credits, Vermont Community Development Program. These are ongoing tools that we know we can use to fund housing. They have a proven track record, and we do continue to bring unit, units online. But we also have new, new ways to approach rehousing folks. Um, one of them being VHIP. Uh, and this, with the efficiency that VHIP is operating at, you know, this extremely low average cost per unit, this is a, this is a tool that, uh, to be able to continue to fund that and to continue to invest in rehabbing this aging Vermont housing stock that we talked about before, this is a way that we can really unleash a lot of this, uh, this housing, especially in parts of the state that often don't see that investment to be able to focus on middle income housing where we often don't see federal or state dollars go to help make sure those folks can get into home ownership. That's a tremendous tool through the Missing Middle Home Ownership Development Program. And I think it bears recognition that um, rental units are also a tremendous tool um, for bringing middle income folks here that need to uh, be able to live near where they work. Um, you know, a, a model like that, like the Missing Middle Home Ownership Development Program, but for developing rental units, uh, I think there is a tool in our toolbox that could be added that could really help make sure that employers are, are able to bring folks here, uh, work good jobs, and uh, make sure that they can find housing that actually, uh, you know, is within the income thresholds. Um, so that's something that I think we should really focus on looking forward. But then, uh, this bottom slice of the pie is where I think we really need to look, look at ourselves and just recognize we just had historic funding. The governor alluded to uh, investing over half a billion dollars in housing over the last few years. And we created or preserved 5,000, less than 5,000 housing units. And that's great, that's tremendous. But with all that funding, that wasn't enough. We weren't able to meet the need with all, all the funding we could have ever imagined. So that has told us, that is a test case that has proven that we need to do something with our land use, with our local zoning, to make it so that we can enable more of this development, so we can let communities plan and develop going forward. Um, you know, I think, I said before it was very intentional, the actions that we took over time to make sure that housing did slow down. So it's gonna take really, really intentional and thoughtful and direct action to make sure that we undo that. Um, I think that that is it. I'm gonna put contact info up here and then we're happy to take some questions. Before, maybe we can just circle back to the original question and I know, I think it was specific to roads, but uh, you touched on this a little bit, but maybe you could just elaborate on how the ARPA package, um, including things like wastewater, was part of the effort to prepare communities for, uh, with the infrastructure they need for housing development? Yep, yep. So some of the funding, including through ANR, uh, as well as through our 
uh, sister department, um, Department of Economic Development, ha has uh, specifically targeted wastewater and other infrastructure to allow for additional development, which um, those constraints often can stop a housing project. Uh, one, because they're so cumbersome to invest in, and two, because there's not always a clear tool for that investment. So um, one of the new, newer programs that um, is housed within the Department of Economic Development, this is CRRP, the Community Revitalization and Recovery Program. So this is an economic development program, but with recognition that additional housing is really an investment in economic development right now, um, the DED has included housing as one of the components that they're gonna be investing in. Um, as well as assistance to municipalities uh, to invest in infrastructure. Both of those are gonna be incredibly useful tools in terms of enabling housing, whether it's directly funding the, the housing project itself or just investing in the infrastructure that's gonna support the housing. Uh, and, and just to say, you know, another tool that has been used, uh, TIF at times can be uh, a really useful tool in terms of creating the funding for that infrastructure um, and whether you know there becomes an opportunity for project-based TIF that you know that that could um, allow for uh, project specific investment in infrastructure but TIF as it exists now has been a useful tool in creating housing goals in terms of new or renovated housing required that would include geography and uh, income levels and are you tracking new and renovated housing and housing that's provided by employers or uh, uh, colleges yes yeah, so i think there's a couple components to that um to that question i think one of them is sort of uh, the, the geographic distribution of new units. Um, you know, in, when it comes to sort of tracking new units, outside of those that we or our partners invest in uh, or, or have some investment in a project, we may not necessarily capture all unit production aside from being able to track building permits. That has a little, a few year lag, so we might not know all unit creation from this past year until later this year. Um, you know, as far as sort of geographic equality and making sure that we're having an equitable investment across the state, that is top of mind um, for, for the governor in terms of making sure ARPA funds are invested across the state. Um, but beyond that, we, uh, you know, Department of Housing and Community Development, we are constantly meeting with VHFA, Vermont Housing Finance Agency, and the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, who are the other major funders. Um, and we discuss exactly this. Uh, who, who's funding what projects? Where are we funding them? Where have we underinvested? Where are there projects that need additional help because of where they're located? So, um, you know, I, as far as specific number goals, uh, I, I, you know, I think we really just look at equitable distribution of investment. Um, and, you know, we, we have at different points set specific goals for housing creation. Uh, I don't know, Josh, do you want to touch on any? I was just going to add, you know, the goals for how many units we need. You know, part of the challenge is we can't meet those goals with just the public investments we have. Yeah. The private market needs to work and solve some of this problem, and it's out of whack. Um, <clears throat> before the pandemic, our housing needs assessment, we do want every five years to get our federal funding from HUD that supports the Emergency Solutions Grant Program, the CDBG Program, the HOME Program, the VHCD administers, and several other, requires us to go and do basically a needs assessment of the housing stock, rental, home ownership, every five years. And at that point in 2019, we needed 5,800 new units just to meet the current demand. I would guess we're probably at 10,000 units at this point, because we've had you know, nearly 5,000 new residents move into the state. Um, but I think what we're experiencing is despite half a billion dollars, and that's just housing construction dollars. There's probably another half a billion for support services, rental assistance. We're not able as, as, as the public to fund every single unit of housing we need. It needs, the, the market needs to work too. And that goes to that underlying issue of our communities need to be prepared with water, sewer, roads, broadband, 
plan for that, help support it through all the different programs that exist so the new housing can be built and our land use regulatory, both at the local and state level, have to be more welcoming for housing development. Because right now, there's many barriers and costs that make that market um, response not work. Um, we're not alone in this. There's other parts of the country that are experiencing this, but we had a cost analysis of our housing done also right before the pandemic that showed that Vermont's cost to build housing was rising faster than our other New England states. So, this has been brewing for a long time. And, and to touch on the logic that led us to the creation of the Missing Middle Home Ownership Development Program, uh, when it's costing about $400,000 to create a single family home that's a, a modest home, two or three bedrooms, that you, you would think would be aimed at some, somebody making about the median income of the area, but you can't sell it for what it cost you to build it or to develop the land. That's just, it, there's a gap right there in that market. And so yeah, this pilot program is, is one step in seeing can we meet that need by helping to fund the creation of these units as well as the purchase, but it's clear we're never ever gonna be able to have enough money to put into that program to be the only solution. It's gotta be a tool, but we've gotta really be able to unleash all the, the private investment and allow development to happen in thoughtful ways. So over here. So, so based on that comment and based on the commissioner's comments a minute ago, um, the you know, US economy is basically a supply demand response uh, uh, environment. So what's inhibiting the private industry from investing in these programs, in, the, in this construction, without state incentives? I, I think there's always going to be a role that incentives are going to play in certain types of housing, but there's also a very clear role that land use and zoning has played in, in getting in the way of these things because um, in order for a certain project to pencil out, perhaps uh, housing needs to be more dense, densely built or more concentrated in a specific area, but if zoning doesn't allow for that, the, the type of building that will currently only be the type of new units that will uh, create the positive cash flows needed to actually build it, well then we're just not gonna get the building. A, 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 a builder can't always rely on public funds to come through to make up that difference. We can do our best with it, but we just had more public housing funds than we're ever gonna have again, and that still didn't quite do it. Yeah, I mean, we're a scarcity you know, situation right now in our housing stock, and so it's driving costs up whether it be rents or for, you know, homes for sale, people at the top are still finding a home to get built for them. But when those numbers, it literally costs you more to build a home than the average family that earns 100% of area meaning income can afford by over $100,000, I'm talking a two bedroom ranch, it, 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 it's so out of whack that we need some um, supports in the system to make that possible and we need longer term changes to our um, uh, building environment in this state, one of them being regulatory, another we need you know, more workforce, you know, we need, uh, there's lots of things, that the five L's of building, uh, um, a, a lot of those are out of whack right now. Some of them are temporary, you know, as far as cost of material and the cost of labor, but a lot of them have been here for a long time. And so the main point is we can't just throw money at this problem and expect we're going to solve it. We've got to do these other things that are foundational and structural to how we got here. So, so my previous question, um, if, if I had a builder that um, had a project that was approved, been approved for 10 or 15 years, hasn't been able to start it because he doesn't have the money to put the road to get it started. Is that something that you people would be interested in? Some, yes. I mean, I've talked to many of those builders that they literally have a parcel they need to put the infrastructure in themselves because well, X city or town no longer does that as part of their sort of municipal management. And so they're looking for funding. So we have probably five or six different sources you can go to to get some of that. Some of it does come with a lot of strings and it takes a lot of lead time. Um, but if you have someone that's in that situation, we certainly can try to direct them to where our sources are to help. I think what uh, Alex was saying is DHCD does not have some of that big investment money. 
Um, we have the VHIP program, we have this federal community development block grant program, which municipalities can apply for to put the water and sewer and roads in to help, but it's, it, it's, it's a fairly complicated federal program. Um, and then there's VHCB, which has large sources of funding. They're often not funding the infrastructure. Usually that's part of that housing development cost, and that's part of what's driving the cost um, up so much is that these properties aren't development ready. And so you're having to bring all that infrastructure cost in at the same time and absorb those costs in the unit. Why one of our strategies is to look at our existing housing stock. That same housing report that I said, the housing needs assessment, said that there was about 19,000 units in Vermont of housing that were in poor quality, likely uh, partially vacant or abandoned, didn't meet code. So that's low hanging fruit, you know, that we should be working on before we spend $400,000 per unit to build new. We ought to get uh, production of what we have as existing housing stock back in use. But you're right, that is a challenge that I hear from many developers that they're in that exact situation and they're trying to piece together the funding and we're trying to show them all the sources with this new money, but it takes water and sewer money, road, you know, there's so many different uh, pieces to, to pull off a, a new neighborhood development. We have actually a pilot right now, which is, it's only a million dollars, but it's a competition where we're hearing from developers, we're inviting them to a round table with all the funders and the regulators at the table, having them pitch their project and then giving them feedback because we're gonna award this million dollars in the spring and it's not enough, but it's to prove the exact concept you're coming up with, that we need a more coordinated way that figures out infrastructure and housing, all those investments that are needed through a, a more coordinated process to award the funding so it could speed up this development. So we'd love to hear the name and, and we can try to get them involved in that project. Yeah, and that, that pilot, it's a, it's a million dollar pilot. It's, it's called the Neighborhood Partnership, or we might have changed it, but Neighborhood Partnership pilot. And uh, yeah, the idea is if we, if if you can choose an area where it's, it's ready for growth and then all resources infrastructure, housing funding, uh, tax incentives, if, if those can all align, can you truly develop a neighborhood? Yeah. And AOT, for example, is on this panel, yeah. and they currently in their planning, they don't have a lot of new, new money for new little roads into development, but this is teaching all of us what we need and how we may need to look at um, asking for budgets differently going forward, how we meet, need to think differently about our investments if we're gonna meet this housing need. Yeah. Well, given that in the, probably the beginning of the 80s, our regulations were explicitly designed to stop growth. And a lot of those folks are still with us today. So if you have a strategy on how you go about changing this, <laughs> I have a feeling the next couple of days you're going to hear some proposals to address those, but uh, yeah, I mean, from from our perspective, um, we can we can continue to chip away with bylaw modernization and municipal planning grants, but that's like I said, going to be one community at a time. And I think there's a wide recognition amongst all of us that uh, fairly large change is going to have to happen, and we need to uh, make sure that legislation focuses on that, on, on sort of helping to remove some of those barriers that were very intentionally put in place. All right, well now we've got to very intentionally remove some of those barriers. And so, um, you know, I think that's going to be statewide land use uh, needs to be consideration. Uh, I think in, in terms of what uh, the state permits for zoning, in communities throughout the state that needs to be under consideration so um, yeah I mean just as an example you know there's a lot of offices that are empty right now there's a lot of schools churches those buildings that we could change into housing but ju just because they exist they don't get a free pass on our regulatory framework they're gonna have to be a change of use through Act 250 through zoning all those add barriers cost time yet we're looking at an empty building that's already has parking has broadband, has water and sewer, and so we need to think smartly about unwinding some of these things. It doesn't have to destroy the environment. You know, when you look at Act 250, the 10 year, 10 units within five years within five miles triggers Act 250. That was clearly established to reduce housing development. And so we have to look at how to unwind that smartly, 
not, not to encourage poor investments all over the hillside that require new broadband and new roads and all that, but let's put them where we want them and get rid of those barriers. Um, that's, that, that is ultimately what Vermont needs. And frankly, we're behind. Our other neighboring states, Maine, New Hampshire, have passed legislation encouraging this sort of um, uh, development in, in dense areas. The federal government's just passed the Yes in My Yard Act, which is gonna be uh, uh, nationwide competition for funding for development. But it's contingent upon you having land use practices that support housing, not prevent it in the right, and support it in the right places. So we've got to catch up. And, and you know, even where we've made attempts at trying to create pathways through Act 250, which happened good, uh, but you know, just for example, within the state designation program, we have certain um, certain pathways to help either expedite or um, exempt from Act 250. Uh, the priority housing projects. Uh, which if, if your housing project meets certain uh, criteria and are within these uh, designated areas, growth center, uh, downtown or village, or, um, you, you can be exempt from Act 250, but even that we've decided to cap based on a community's population. So rather than acknowledge that, okay, this meets all the criteria, it's a priority housing project, and rather than allow the community and the developer to determine what the need is for that community, we're capping it. And we're saying, if you create more housing than this cap, now you've gotta go through Act 250, even though it's in an area where we already decided we want growth, we've invested in the infrastructure for growth, we should be enabling and encouraging growth so that we don't sprawl more broadly outside of the built infrastructure, but we're still capping it. Two minutes left. Um, so, if any of the, any remaining questions, just connect with us after the fact. Okay. Um, how many units have we built in the past couple of years, and what percentage of those units are occupied by the target population? Do you have any idea on that? I think that so. With the funding, with the affordable housing investments we've made, there are. We're predicting we're gonna uh, produce 4,000 units of affordable housing with about a third of them designated to folks exiting homelessness. Not all those are built yet. About half of them are built. Um, but that's just our public investments. There's other housing going on that's being built out there, but it's not going to those least, uh, you know, those at the most affordable, um, they're not going to those that need the most affordable housing. So that's why we're injecting this funding but we need a lot more than that. And that is triple, we've been producing three times as much affordable housing over the last three years than we did prior to the pandemic with all this investment. So how much of that is occupied? Okay, you, you've got 4,000 yep. units. So 2, I think about, about 2,000 has been built and is occupied. Okay. Yeah. All right, I think that concludes our time. Um, so I know there might be a lot of lingering questions. Uh, the contact information for everybody is on the handouts. Uh, if you haven't had those yet, Amanda has them for you. Um, and we're happy to answer your questions, give you more information um, throughout, you know, throughout the week, throughout the session, however we can be helpful on this topic. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Yep. Thank you.